Hello and welcome to Gravitas Wins Conversations. We have heard words have power. Today's guest is an embodiment of that phrase. She has risen from ashes with words. I hope you will enjoy my conversation with my good friend Ritika. Hello Ritika, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much, JJ. This is such a pleasure and I'm super excited to be on the show with you today. I feel honored. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I feel honored, but also anxious. Let's see how it goes. All the best. Thank you. Uh, Ritika, let's start with the word that you mentioned in the LinkedIn, sapiosexual. What does it mean? Why is it special for you? So um, it actually means, um, I shouldn't be saying this being a woman, I'm going to be judged for this really bad, but you were one of the very few people amongst very other few people who picked up this word on my LinkedIn and were completely uh, taken aback and they thought it was very bizarre and extremely courageous and very, very, um, there is no other word I want to use, but yeah, be deep there uh, of me to uh, put that word out there on my LinkedIn profile. It essentially means a person who is um, attracted to someone uh, physically, so to say, by their intelligence and not by their looks or physicality, so to say. Um, so it is a sort of intellectual attraction that you have, which manifests itself at some point physically as well. Uh, were you always attracted to words or is this the only thing that you are attracted to? No, um, I think um, JJ, as a young kid, uh, one of the things that really explains my personality today was that I was a very overweight child. So um, anything and everything, and body shaming was a very, very big thing. And people didn't even know it was a word and nobody really did anything about it, whether it was parents because of lack of ignorance. Uh, but I was a very, very sensitive child and I took I internalized all of that body shaming. I mean, till date, I'm 46 years old, but what happened with me at probably six years of age is something that I've still internalized. It's still difficult for me to, um, you know, uh, deal with uh, body image issues, right? Um, but having said that, I think one of the things that happened, um, I wanted to use collateral damage earlier, but now it looks more like an advantage at 46, is that when you don't want to be out there in the open, you're not, not doing theater, you're not doing sports, you're not doing any extracurricular activities, just basis your weight um so anything in the classroom or outside of it which required me to get any kind of attention was where mm. i would suddenly want to take a back seat i'm i'm like i'd like to be invisible so my only um uh, sort of uh, things that i could lean on was books i mean they were non-judgmental and they just took you into a world which nobody had seen before so I think that seed was sown very early in life. Um, also, I had a, a parent uh, who was extremely, extremely fond of reading. And um, I just took it from him. My father was a very, very voracious reader. So there were books, you know, scattered around in the house. And uh, I just started to pick up and started to read. And then it just started to enjoy it. And then probably I think by the time I reached college, university, the levels were such that I was reading almost four to five books in a day. And I would even forget, you know, there is lunch to be served, there's dinner. It's like, it's it's the hottest month of the year. It is June. And, you know, I would forget to switch on my fan in my room. But when I'm reading, I'm just reading. So everything else would kind of just, you know, blip itself out. So that kind of, uh, you know, made me realize and uh, that how much this world meant to me. And, uh, you know, practically, though, I mean, books have been my friends, my confidants, my mentors, uh, everything today that I stand, I think 80% of who I am today is just the kind of books that I read. I wasn't a writer then. Um, never used to write much a poem here or there once in a while, that kind of thing. Uh, but the books really, I mean, I still, you know, I mean, I, I, I hold them uh, dearly like babies, my old books, you know, the ones that I've been reading 30 years, 25 years. I mean, just I, when I hold them, I literally don't hold them. I kind of cradle them in my hand. Uh, that kind of uh, emotion is attached there. So I think the love for words happened much later when you started to pen things down and you realize the power that you had because I think all that reading probably never came in handy except for when you would speak to someone so someone will you know put it across as oh Ritika you have great communication skills and you know the communication is basically nothing but one the confidence and two the power of the language which is like your control and how well you know your language. When did you translate or rather transfer from just reading into writing? Um, I think that um, I think this probably happened uh, 
somewhere when I was uh, still um, 1999, um, just, I was probably 24 years old, just before I was married, I started to pen some stuff down. I started to edit stuff. I, I was working in a in an immigration company. So it was easier for me to edit stuff. It was easier. People would want something and they'll come to me and I said, okay, fine, I can put this. I would translate thoughts into words sooner than other people would, uh, especially if they're in English. You give me a Hindi, you give me a Punjabi, I will struggle for a bit. But English came naturally to me. So I said, okay, find this something that I can do. But then you get married again and then you are like, you know, life takes a backseat and you're just busy raising kids, you're doing stuff. And then I worked with Max New York Life for about a year. And uh, there also, again, everybody would put it as not writing skills, but as communication skills, because there's mm. frankly not much writing that I was doing. Um, but uh, my writing, in fact, maximum, I think it bloomed. And I realized the power when I was doing my master's in English literature from Punjab University. And uh, one of the things that I remember, one of my teachers, professors told me that, um, Ritika, you could read as many books as you wanted, but at the end, when you are writing or you are, you know, writing a critical comment on, let us say, uh, a poem or a, a, a drama piece or let us say a novel, uh, everything is okay. It's good to show off your knowledge and say, oh, I know what this critic said. I know what this angle, that angle. But in the end, put your own stuff. I think, uh, you know, your own perspective at the end of the answer. I think there was a stage when he had to told me to, you know, tell me to tone it down a little bit. He's like, Ritika, you are you're putting more emphasis on what you think and how you relate to it than what other people are saying about it or the critics have said about it. So I think that is when I started to get the confidence and I understand this. And, and I read philosophy also. By that time, I was a huge fan of comics. I mean, I'm just like my entire gamut was of whatever that I could put my hands on, I'm going to read it. So I hope that answers your question too. Yes, definitely. When did that love for words change into the business of words? How did you end up starting a business? So um, I wish I could say, Joseph, most of us have those really nice, endearing, uh, you know, stories to tell. I started writing out a passion. It was always a passion, blah, 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 blah. But that never happened with me. Um, uh, to cut a long story short, I needed the money and anything came my way, which will help me make money at the age of 38, I was willing to do. And um, to be fair, um, I just got lucky with it that uh, content writing just fell into my lap. I mean, somebody just out of the blue, they mentioned a lot of things. Somebody said Tupperware, somebody said Amway, somebody said sell this, somebody said that. But one of the people said content writing. I said, what does it even mean? So this gentleman goes out, oh, nothing. They'll give you a piece of content. You just have to edit it. And I said, okay, fine. This is doable stuff. I can do that. And luckily for me, I was um, not like a typical housewife, even though I was married for 12 years. I was not a typical housewife. Um, uh, I would still read the Economic Times back to back, right? Um, um, though I had nothing to do with business, I was just a simple housewife raising two kids in a city like Bombay. But now words and copywriting and branding and advertising and all of that would always get my attention. Um, and I think um, uh, when I started to write, when the first project came in, I said, this is easy stuff. I can do better. And then I would call up the guy and said, OK, you know what? This it just doesn't need editing. It just needs rewriting. So he says, sure, why don't you give it a shot? And he was like, Isko kya aega? how would she know what needs to be done? And, you know, she doesn't know much about a brand, etc., etc. So I said, why don't you just spend 10 minutes with me and tell me what is the brand about? And I'll probably be able to do justice to it. And um, that's when I rewrote the, uh, the whole piece. And they were like, OK, this is good stuff. I was personally happy with what I wrote. I was like, oh, this is great stuff. I mean, yeah, this has come out really well. So I think um, content writing just fell into my lap. And... Um, in the first two years, I did not think of it as passion or, uh, you know, anything that I was super interested in. And like I always say, entrepreneurship is about having a sustained agenda. So my initial agenda was all about earning money, making sure that there's money in the bank. I was raising two kids all by myself. Um, so the agenda was that. But two years down the line, when I'd made some money, life is slightly more comfortable is when the agenda changed. And I go, OK, I like this stuff that I'm doing. So then uh, then I, you know, just went for it then everything else took a backseat and I said, okay nothing else no more and this is exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life so that's how it all started so the necessity became a passion later 
later, much later, much, much later, actually. And then I said, okay, this is fine. So send me on a vacation to go. And this actually happened just probably sometime around 2015, 16. It was my daughter's birthday. We were sitting on a beach in Goa. And while everybody was sipping their drinks, doing their own thing, you know, enjoying the water. And I was sitting with my laptop and my, my I remember my, um, uh, um, I think, uh, um, 14 year old son he came and he said that mama you're not supposed to be working on a vacation I said dude you've no idea how much I'm enjoying this I mean so back off everybody let me do my thing I mean so having that bottle of beer in my hand and my laptop and doing my stuff as I'm sitting in Goa on a beach was like the perfect setting I went okay this is doable so that's how I uh, you know I felt about my work at that stage in life Okay. Uh, Ritika, are you from a business family? How did that initial sale happen? The first sale happened. Who was your first customer? And from there, how did you grow up? So no business family at all. My dad was an Indian Air Force uh, fighter pilot. And unfortunately, we lost him in an air crash in 1990. And uh, that's how we moved back to Chandigarh. And uh, then I did my master's, did my graduation, did my master's. And, uh, you know, it was like a typical... Uh, um, Joseph uh, family where I was 22, 23, my mom was hyperventilating that this girl needs to get married, you know, dad's not around blah, blah, blah. And everything that I would pick up, my mom would say, Arena, you don't know where you'll get married. Why start this? Why start this? So I felt very unsettled and very uncentered because I think everything in my life is centering around marriage that the guy I get married to, whether he's going to allow me to work, not work. Is it going to be this city, that city? Do I want to do this? I want to uh, you know, become a journalist. I mean, everything was question mark and everything centered around getting married. So I said, okay, fine, screw it. Let's just get married. So for one year, I was just focusing on getting married only. I said, somehow get me a guy, get me married so that I know where my life is going post that. So um, it started with that. Then I worked for about a year as a customer support person for Max New York Life. And then I um, uh, was put on bed rest. I was expecting my uh, first child. So then everything, all the ambition, everything went out of the window. I said, okay, this is fine. So then I was sitting at home doing bed rest, watching all those Ekta Kapoor serials, you know, the Kabhi Kyunki Sasbi, Kabhi Bhauti, all that nonsense happened. So that went on for a couple of years, I think. And uh, it is only, uh, frankly, JJ, if the financial distress would not have happened, when you're down to your last rupee and you you see yourself and you see two young kids, school going kids, I think I was like, okay, it can't go worse than this. I mean, this is what it is. So I think when that happened, I didn't have an option but to just say, okay, fine, then just do whatever comes our way. So anything that even will fetch me 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 2,000 bucks, I would just go for it. So um, um, I remember the my mentor I just met accidentally and they were supposed to hire me for a job in, our, um, in an incubator. And this is my favorite story to tell. And um, the guy who interviewed me had, uh, you know, no idea of my background. I came through a reference and I didn't get time to Google him up. And this guy's like, oh, you know who I am? Blah, blah. I said, no, sorry, sir. I don't know. It says we're opening an incubation center. The moment he said incubation center, the things in my mind that were running was, I'm not going to do field visits. I hate chickens. I hate the smell of chickens. I hate this. I hate that. So all of that is going. And I kept on telling him, I said, sir, I'm not going to be doing field visits. So he's like, no, we don't I have to expect you to travel and this and that i said this office looks pretty swanky and everything looks great uh, but it is much later i realized damn it an incubator had nothing to do with chickens at all i mean the guy meant like a startup incubator i mean it was hilarious uh, but the guy still hired me okay and unfortunately things didn't work out and he said that you know he introduced me to his partner based out of good cow he says he's taking care of the other leg of the incubator so why don't you connect with him and see if he likes you enough we are on I said, fine. And everything went well. I spoke to the gentleman. I think after a month when I was supposed to join them, uh, the whole company went kaput. These guys had gone missing in action. And I was all over the place, howling my eyes out that, oh, damn, what do I do? This is supposed to get me 40,000 bucks a month. Where is this money going to come from? This is like the initial days, I think, 2012, 13. And... Um, and that's when, you know, this gentleman, I call him up and I say that, uh, you know, uh, where are you guys? I mean, nobody's picking up the phone. The office is shut and I really don't know what to do. He says, oh, you don't know. This is what has happened, blah, blah, blah. So I, I was like bawling my eyes out. Okay. The most unprofessional woman you'll ever meet on the face of this earth. And I'm bawling my eyes out. And this guy's like, you know, ma'am, you don't have to cry this and that. I said, no, I need a job. I mean, how am I going to support my kids? Uh, so then this guy goes, this is okay. What I can do? And this he 
called me after a week and he just thought that I was too desperate and he said that um, ma'am I can would you like to do, do some writing work he's who introduced me to content writing I said yeah I can do some stuff and he says that um, you know I write faster than I can uh, think I mean sorry I think faster than I write so I usually blabber and it, you know it, it doesn't make sense to the reader so could you put all of that together for me I said okay this easy stuff I can do it and then he said that uh, but you know that I can't pay you for it and then I started bawling all over again I was like dude that's the only thing I want I want money I don't want to do your blabbering stuff I mean just give me the money and he's like uh uh, you know what I can do in because I don't have money either. I drained my last penny in this startup venture, and this when this whole thing went kaput, I uh, I I'm out of all my life savings as well. So what I can do is that in uh, we'll do a barter system that you do the writing for me free of cost, and I will give you some projects and introduce you to a couple of people in my ecosystem. And um, despite him losing all his money in a startup venture, he was still one of the most respected people in the entrepreneurial community. I mean. Uh, he lost all his money, lost other people's money, but there were people who were still willing to bet on him. And this I figured much later. So I said, okay, fine, something is better than nothing, even a project. And so he was the one who gave me my first content writing job. That happened. And it was a little brochure for a small, very small little insurance company that I remember I did. And that's when I told them that, you know, that I can, I can do a better job. This doesn't need just an edit. It needs a rewrite as well. So that's how the first project happened. And then after that, uh, mostly my mentor would do the pitching for me because I would suck at it. And I wouldn't even know things like incubator or accelerator. For me, the accelerator was what you had in a car. I mean, that's all that you knew. I mean, who else knew anything else? So he would do the pitching for me. I would make sure. And then he'll take me on that, you know, she's my uh, part of my team. And I used to get scolded. He was a very, very, very harsh taskmaster. I mean, I... I was and I was unprofessional so every time uh, we would have a conversation like Burma used to go and the kids used to laugh you know that okay mama and uncle are at it again I mean mama's sir is scolding her and this and that so it used to happen at least five sometimes in a day I mean I was that bad um, but I think we somehow managed to pull through and uh, slowly and steadily the calls you know came down from 10 to 9 to 8 to whatever and my dependencies decreased and then one day he just said okay fine your birthday gift is uh, this uh, this company and he gave me the website as a birthday gift he gave me my cards he made a company out of it my logo everything was designed and I remember on my birthday uh, early in the morning he's like eight o'clock I said sir aaj to chutti hai, sir aaj kaam nahi we will not work today's birthday this that kids are waking up you know all of that he's no no open open and I said okay so it's this type content factory so I typed it and I said oh new client interesting website so he says darling this is for you now you've grown up and I still remember his words he says I have now taught you how to fish now you don't have to be dependent on me to get you the fish every time or you know uh get any bait so i said okay fine so that's when i slowly and steadily we do a lot of projects to, um, together even today but he's successfully running his own thing and i'm pretty much 99.9 percent .9 on my own feet so um there are times when i go to him crying all the day oh i don't have a client give me something here get me some make a couple of recommendations do this do that but i think that's how the first Peace came together and then life was amazing after that because this gentleman was the kindest soul I've ever met and continues to be one of those people in my life today and um, Joseph I kid you not uh, he has filtered out all my uh, clients so uh, the ones which had no integrity or people who were slimy or you know would say something to something he just never introduced me to those people even if it meant a uh, business coming my way so it's oh no no we're not going to work with him I said nobody called he has a great offer blah blah he says no we're not working with him and him or her and uh, that was one of the things that I got a lot of filtered people to work with so they were very curated by him personally personally so I had very less uh, you know sad stories and issues to talk about love about clients mistreating me or you know me not being able to deliver etc etc or nastiness with clients that was part one and part two the other brilliant thing he did was he never introduced me to uh, anybody below the CEO so I mean a tucker mm -hmm. introduced me so when you are dealing with somebody at the CEO level 
uh, I think life changes and, uh, you know, the kind of work you end up doing for them becomes very, very different. With a way someone at a lower level, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, disregarding anybody's uh, profile. But having said that, that when you're talking to the person, that one person who's going to do, the decisions are made faster. So, you know, the convincing powers are faster. It's like, okay, this is what she's saying. Go ahead, do this, do this, and life is sorted. And then I don't, you know, like really deal with him again. Then it's the team and whatever else happened. So those two things, I think, kind of cinched it for me in terms of getting more business and life became much easier after that. How long you've been in business now? Um, I started um, in 2012, technically. Uh, was doing something, was all over the place. But I think Content Factory happened in 2013 when I can legitimately say that I was a content writer by that time, by 2013. So that's one of the things that happened. So so you started with content writing. What are the range of services now you are into now? Uh, so as on today, JJ, we are um, not just a content agency. So we don't just write content. We manage it for you. Uh, we um, distribute the content for different, different platforms. Then we also became a digital marketing agency. We started doing PR and outreach. Um, and then we thought that, okay, fine, let's get into website designing as well. So we got a team which was fantastic at doing websites. Then I was always interested in branding, you know, about positioning statements. Like my my core competency individually uh, as a writer is in those uh, one-liners, right? So mm. give me a thousand word thing and I will lose my stuff somewhere. I will lose my way somewhere after 200 words. But give me less than 200 words to write and I do a great job at that. So... Um, that's when I realized, okay, no, this doesn't read right. So we, we were getting a lot of real estate clients and they were all saying the same things over and over again, you know, greenery, blah, 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 clean air, um, um, a city within a city, heaven for your children, all of that. So I said, okay, this is not just, so one of these guys I just met and I said, you're all doing the same thing. Why don't we change this a little bit? Why don't we put this angle? Why don't you bring this out? I mean, and I was looking at it more from a home buyer myself, that if I was to buy a home, this doesn't get my uh, uh, um, attention any in any case so i think when that started to happen i realized that okay this this kind of is something that is again up my alley and i need to you know work on this so slowly and steadily as we went along like just kept on building skill sets kept on hiring people who are way smarter than i was i am uh, and uh, then we now we also do seo we do google adwords so the work so we like a one stop shop Sometimes you get a bigger client. Um, in that case, I have collaborators, people that I worked with in the last five, seven years and completely trustworthy people that you can rely on. Um, then for bigger clients, we outsource the work, but we are still a single point of contact for the client, just for ease of business kind of a thing. How do you build your team? How did I build my team? Um, um, that was a bit of a challenge in the initial days because uh, this is the hilarious bit because we were content writers, right? And um, I remember there was this platform called Shiro's. I mean, not was, is, and they're doing very well for themselves. Sairi, now their founder is a very dear friend. And I worked with them. I'm a mentor. I'm a champion at the, on their this thing. But initially, they were the ones whom I had gone and created my profile on and wanted to do some content writing so that work would come online to me. Um, um, and I still remember the first ad that I put out for a content writer when my work started to get a little more busy and, you know, I needed more people to help with. Um, I got, um, uh, JJ, this is, this is like really funny. Okay. I got some 700 applications, uh, okay. For content writers, 700, it took me five days to kind of just sift and sort and sift and sort. And the kind of people who were calling themselves content writers, I mean, initially I was laughing my head off and then it started to build into anger. And then the entire rejection of the, it's like, this is the most abused word ever. One mm. is life coaches and one is uh, content writers sure. because anybody who feels that they have written two lines as a content writer, right? So there was nothing in terms of, uh, okay, I was like, I went crazy in those five days trying to sift and sort and filter, you know, go into the CV trying to, then I said, okay, this really doesn't matter i realized uh, much later i said the only way i do hiring today is probably a five minute phone call that's it and i would hire my team and i've had i think in the last about two months i've had three new people all over a phone call and uh, the only thing i would say is one if they're affable people if they're nice to talk to they're uh, fundamentally uh, polite and have their mannerisms in place um, two um, i look for command over the language 
uh, which is uh, that how they speak to me, are they making any grammatical errors, choice of words, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, the third thing is um, if they really, really want to work. I mean, you, mm. you see your desperation in there that, you know, you hear it in that voice and say that, no, ma'am, I really want this job. I really looking forward. I really needed to do something. And then you just, so I would not never ask any of them that what is your background like? Where have you studied, et cetera, et cetera. Once that part is cinched is when I say, okay, fine. Now I need to see a sample of your work. And the sample is not again. I mean, the hiring is more or less done. But the sample is just to understand that what is their core competency in writing, right? Is it technical? Is it non-technical? How good they are at writing a certain piece? Um, uh, so that when we have all kinds of clients that come to us mm. with content requirements, we are able to assign the right kind of work to the right person. That is the only challenge I have realized because more or less, I think we figured by now, we all know who's good at doing what. Uh, you know, so we've a solid team of seven, eight girls who are uh, like right in the middle of things. And then there are other five, seven, which keep coming and going in terms of freelancing, in terms of projects. But seven, eight are like my core group of people. I mean, they, they just always have work, God is kind. So uh, with them, um, it is now uh, I've reached a stage that, okay, fine. If they sent me something, I'll probably not even open and check it. I mean, I'm saying this on a public platform, but um, but some of the newbies, et cetera, et cetera, I would take a look. Or if there is a new client who needs to understand or their strategy needs to be understood. And then I personally get into the briefing bit, trying to understand uh, what exactly is it the client requires. So the first brief comes from me, the second brief from the client, and then we huddle together and then we take a call as to what needs to be done. So um, essentially, and I think much later, uh, one of the things that I realized, Joseph, was very, very important and which now I put it forward in the first conversation itself is that for me turnaround times are critically 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 important if you are and i always pick up work and give it to my team as per their convenience so i'll say okay fine mm -hmm. here are 10 blogs put in due dates by when you want to submit all of these and the rest of the month you just keep sending it to me i go check once in three four days to see if this article is coming if the client is asking for something there's uh, you know something that needs to come out on an urgent basis etc etc so turnaround times is very very critical for me and second, uh, you need to behave like a professional, which means that a lot of women in India think that content writing, sitting at home and doing this like a work from home thing, that you can do whatever you want to. So I remember this one incident where we were supposed to travel for a vacation on a weekend. It was Saturday and Sunday and I took up a, a, a you know a project which was supposed to be delivered by Sunday evening and I took the project on Friday. So I checked with my team that this means seven, eight hours on a Saturday, seven, eight hours on a Sunday. Do you think you can swing it? Yeah, yeah, man, go ahead, pick it up, blah, blah, blah. So all thing happened. Um, Saturday morning when I am ready to go, uh, this woman, she gives me a call, part of my team. She says, ma'am, I'm sorry. I don't think I'll be able to work today. Something has come up. I have to go with my, ha. Huh. She said, I have to go for a movie with my husband. So I'm like, uh, okay. I said, you go, that's two, three hours. Then my whole thing was that, you know, you make up for it once you're back. I mean, so suppose you're going 11, you're back by 2, 2.30. Then your eight hours should go until 10 o'clock in the night, right? So I said, you can do whatever you want to. And I was like, why is she even sharing this with me? She said, no, ma'am, I just want to let you know by that to by until 2 o'clock, I'll not be able to work. I said, okay. And luckily for us, uh, Joseph, that my overnight stay plan for a vacation with my children uh, canceled and everybody said, okay, we'll go Sunday morning and be back Sunday evening. And this is a program that I had initiated by telling everybody, I need a break. We all need a break, blah, blah, blah. By 10 o'clock in the night on a Saturday, no work had been done. Then I panicked because I said, Sunday, I, nobody can work 16 hours. It's inhuman for anybody. Even if they want to, they can't, right? So then I give her a call and then she's not taking my calls on a Saturday night. I said, oh my God, what is happening? So anyways, on Sunday morning, she finally calls me back. And um, I said, look, we need to start working because this thing. So I think I will have to pitch in two, three hours. You let me know and let's divide the work and I will put in two, three hours. So she said, no, ma'am, today Today I can't work. Sunday I cannot work. I said, no, Sunday, what happened? Today, we have Satya Narayan Puja in the house. My mother-in-law is doing it. I was like, okay, fine. So I said, fine, you please go ahead, do your Satya Narayan Puja and take care of it. So I got my mentor. I said, look, I've committed. If I don't, the client's work will suffer. Apart from my own branding, we go for a toss. So the vacation did not happen. 
uh, the kids didn't go i didn't go nobody went and we all just sat down and for the next 14 15 hours we just sat down and did the work committed finished we couldn't finish it by sunday night also joseph so it went on till monday morning early morning i think we uh, didn't put in uh, you know pull an overnight up but yeah mostly the two three o'clock in the morning both of us were working so that's what happened and that's when i realized that you know people when they look at a work from home especially a woman you know the husbands also don't understand this that are you're working from home only now you can do it later what's the point what's the whole point of working from home when you can't go watch a movie otherwise you might as well be in a corporate job so i'm saying that if you are thinking of this as a side hustle or something and you're going to be taking this lightly let's just not do it in the first place so i need i and the tough part is and jj i do understand because when women are working the, see we are a consultancy business right so sometimes we have retainers sometimes the projects come and go right so there are months when we are very very lean right um so it is very challenging for a writer in my team i get that because either you have a steady stream of work so you have a proper schedule you know you're busy and the money is in the end of the month are coming in so you know the spouses are also pretty supportive and they realize okay this woman is you know getting home 40 50 60 grand uh, every month uh, but i think it becomes challenging for them to keep on you know going around uh, so one month you're very lean and suddenly there'll be too much mm. of work because then and there are turnaround times and i'm very particular about deadlines so it becomes challenging no doubt uh but then i was like what what the hell i mean what's life without a challenge i mean if you can't deal with it then you might as well not do anything because if during the time of challenge you're going to be losing your mind i don't want to deal with a person mm. like that so just keep your wits about Very it true. stuff i understand that but that's what <laughs> adulting and that's what maturity is all about that um, even during a challenging time you're able to keep your wits about you so that's the Very true one of the other thing that i really admire in you is your networking capabilities ah. uh, <laughs> uh, I, i've seen you move with grace and poise in many of the networking events even among the most well respected names in business whether it is in tri city or or elsewhere also how can somebody develop that particular skill was it your nature uh, especially i'm asking many of the listeners many of my friends they are all in it industry and whether it is men i mean even i have that particular problem but uh, more so uh, women we have this particular problem of networking and especially women you know i mean uh, some of them they don't network at all they they hesitate to reach out to people so the question is if somebody is starting how should they think about it how should they go about it and what would you advise them so two three things come into play here jj one um i'm a 4g kid right so uh, a complete 4g brat so uh, confidence etc though it came very late to me in life because i mentioned like you know because of my overweight issues and stuff like that so i was again a huge introvert never seen never heard kind of a person for a long long time i yeah. think it is much later when after doing my masters when i did very well for myself and there was some amount of respect that came uh, you know from your friends and your teachers and the entire ecosystem um that's when i really started to find my way uh, you know and then i realized i'm a people's person i mean i'm like how weird is that because you've been one of those extreme introverts all your life and then suddenly you just want to like go and i think um um also because uh, uh you know the forge does this to you uh for me when i connect with people and also helps me i think to to some extent because i am a very very spiritual person i think when i connect with people somehow things about their language their background their financial status um their religion or their gender or age just kind of don't those boundaries are not there for me so if i have to connect with someone i will connect i mean i will just go and walk up to them whether it is a sabzi wala in my building whether it is a gatekeeper somewhere whether it is a ceo whether it is a a, a doctor or any other professional there's a president or whatever i'll just go i feel the connect i'll just go that's it i i mean i just don't stop myself because why i just feel something and i just go and connect with them right um this is one part the other part is i realize that um especially when you are networking professionally there's something we don't really understand you know when i was in bombay um my entire uh, social circle was around bankers right because my ex husband was a banker so we were like the youngest couple in that entire social setup there were other people who were by that time you know 40 45 sitting ceos and 
all of them each one of them had done amazingly well for themselves professionally and all coming from very humble backgrounds nobody born with a silver spoon in their mouth right and um, and i used to just keep hearing stories you know that this happened in the bank and this happened somebody spoke like that somebody spoke like that but uh, because i was a not working uh, person i was a housewife so when we would meet socially these guys would like sit on floors sit on carpets and you know just about uh, laugh their hearts out and then they'll speak stuff which uh, you know which is like you like oh my god is this your for company how can he talk like that how is he talking how is she talking and there were men there were women right and i was like the least uh, noticeable person in the room right so but i used to be absorbing a lot of that and i realized that um, a lot of them would have these really bad tempers okay people don't walk into their doors and you knock and if the first knock you don't answer something you know the really people are scared and uh, i said you know these guys will scream shout abuses and everything like a complete uh, you know old boys home, uh, um, group kind of a thing so when i realized and i started chatting them up because i had nothing to gain or lose right because i'm like this young uh, woman in a social setup who's just trying to absorb her surroundings and all of that so i would chat them up and they were like wonderful wonderful people and that is i think somehow subconsciously i realized that you may be a sitting ceo you may be a president of a company you may be anybody at the end of the day you're a human being right mm. you're a human being so uh, and if you can connect to that human being you won your battle with you know with the networking thing so i would always connect with people because they are people not because they are presidents or they are ceos or whatever they may have what whatever profile so i think the biggest mistake um, all of us tend to do is or make is that we always judge people and we have these barriers already in place right oh i should not be walking up to them i may just look very uh, you know want to be kind of a thing i may just look i wouldn't care i mean uh, this is joke in my uh, you know circle of friends that um, on my facebook if you go you will see uh, the top most hot shot uh doctor who is like broken limb ka book of records he is a facebook friend and then there is another guy who is their gatekeeper for the hospital so he is my facebook friend too and i'm you know dealing with both of them so this is huge joke that if you want to find any gatekeepers across anywhere from sector 17 to any this thing you will find them on ritika's facebook profile all these people are there on my profile and somehow it, it just doesn't matter to me so it's hilarious you know because this doctor one once asked me he says how is this guy your friend i said because every time i come i don't have to do anything i just leave my car keys and he says madam you please come because i'm you're in a hospital you're obviously rushed i mean there's obviously something not right right so this guy never ever the same way when i was uh, going to the courts this is guy uh, outside uh, the, the premises i don't know uh, joseph i've never ever parked my car i mean it is just go and it will come that's all that used to happen so i have tremendous amount of respect for these people because i believe that there is a genuine hard work they are standing in the sun um, in in the months of june july august it's uh, raining whatever it is and these guys are just going about their business and uh, i respect them because they're just genuinely nice people i mean they would see a woman like me in distress and i most of the time they make tears in my eyes and one of them will you know the first time this guy did it to me is like ma'am you're very upset just give me the car keys you will bang your car I said okay, fine, just do it. And I didn't bother whether there was money lying around in my uh, this thing. There was stuff lying around in my car. It just it just clicked. It just happened. So I think when it comes to networking, it is all about uh, just connecting with the person. I think we should just remove those mental barriers. Whether he's a man, he's a woman, he's gay, he's CEO, he's junior assistant, he's whatever whatever i think this is sardar this is non sardar this is flana dimkan i think it's just they're just barriers to connecting with the world so when you go for networking genuinely go ahead and meet the people that you like in a room that's all that i say so there are 10 people in a room go and speak to the person that you find the nicest in the room Mm. I have graduated from that a bit. Now I always say that either you be the smartest person in the room or go and talk to the smart. You should be talking to the smartest person in the room. So that's my sapio sexuality coming into the picture. That's how I look at it. Okay. Uh in addition to running a successful business and a mother of two kids, uh you also play an active role in Thai Chandigarh and She Rose and and so many other uh, ventures. what's the secret to your energy how do you manage your energy and time 
I think um, I'm blessed because, um, frankly, I don't believe in this uh, this uh, perfect balance, you know, of work. Mm. And, uh, mm. this thing. I, I, I think it's an irrelevant, completely baseless concept. Uh, personally, I believe that there will be times when your work will demand much more attention than your children or home front or whatever it is that you do or friends for family for that matter. And there will be days when the friends or the family or children will require 100% of your attention work be damned. So I don't believe in this. Uh, I think it's very logical uh, to even assume or even think that there will ever be a work-life balance so that uh, flew out of the window from day one for me that okay fine there are days and I will just do two two days I'm just working working I don't know what the kids are doing whether they've had their milk or not whether the tiffin happened didn't happen all of that and there are days and I'm just my child is unwell or the child just is looking sad or something then two days I'm just with the child of course there's little when I say just with the child I mean your emails are happening stuff on the side is happening when you're working you know the kids are sitting right and luckily for me I've been a work from home business uh, from day one even much before for Corona since 2012-13. So I was always, you know, around. I could see, okay, this child is sitting there. I know that they've not had their breakfast. I know they've not finished their meal. I know all of that, but I'm just letting them be. But so I'm just there because at least I know what's happening, right? So that is one. And two, I'm a type A hyper personality. So my mind needs to be occupied all the time. I mean, I need to be doing something. So I find it very, uh, I used to, now I'm changing. I used to find it very, uh, you know, uh, weird and kind of uh, it's it's an out of the world experience for me to see that how can you just sit and do nothing I mean there has mm. to be something you're doing right so I'm this person who will be reading a book on the on one side the tv is on and then you know there is whatsapp happening on the side so I'm like this multitasker but now I'm changing I have realized that uh, you know there are times and I remember a friend is teaching me this that you know Ritika when you're fasting you and I know we talked about intermittent fasting and all but he says you need to fast your mind as well so mm -hmm. if there is constant stuff which is getting into the mind you need to sometimes think take a step back and think through things I used to find this really funny so this one friend of mine he uh, he went um, and he's like this very very senior guy okay uh, uh, fortune 500 consultant and all of that so uh, one time i asked him i said uh, um, where were you the last seven eight hours so he said i'm sitting on the beach so i said Cha, what were you doing on the beach nothing i was just sitting so i said nobody will be doing something on the beach right and he said you were there for seven eight hours what you do nothing so I said, no, you must have had your phone with you. He says, phone I didn't take. That's why when you were calling, I didn't take your call. So I said, you take your phone also. He said, no. I said, then you must be sitting with someone. There may be, you know, other people there, maybe family, whatever. No, I was sitting all by myself. I'm like, dude, are you, are you absolutely freaking nuts in your head? And he was looking at me like, why do you talk so much in the first place? So we were like two extreme people, okay? And I'm like, and that hit me, Joseph, because... This man was sitting on a beach for seven, eight hours. I And I'm asking him things like, you know, I'm like completely gone uh, berserk. I'm asking him questions like, are you sad? Are you depressed? Are you anxious? He said, no, I'm absolutely fine. I said, but why would you want to go and sit there for eight hours doing nothing? He said, I was thinking about my life. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about how to get my work done. I was thinking about solving a problem. I was thinking, I'm like, dude, this is, this is new stuff for me. So that is when I realized that it's like that same logic we use for fasting, right? When we are constantly eating every hour, mm. you know that, right? That we are constantly putting pressure on our liver. We're not allowing ourselves to, the, the stomachs to, you know, give, use the enzymes, blah, blah, blah. We know all of that. It's the same way he taught me that how important it is. I said, the only time I'm not doing anything else is when I'm probably showering. So I just say, okay, oh, I got this answer to this question while I was showering. So I call them my shower moments. But I think um, now in the last five, six months, I'm changing as a person. I sit, I, I mean, I'm sitting in my car. I'm not making a call. I'm sitting in my car. I'm not playing music. I'm just sitting in my car. I'm still driving, but I'm, I mean, I mean, I haven't reached a stage where I'm sitting and not doing anything. I'm just, just driving. But at least I've got myself to that level. When I'm walking in the mornings, I do almost two, two and a half hours of walking morning, evening, right? Uh, uh, total. So I'm training myself. There have been days, Joseph, when I would go for a walk. I couldn't make a phone call. I'll come back home because there was no one to talk to. 
so my mom was like you just went and you came back i said yeah my friend whom i was supposed to talk to she's busy she's not well blah 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 so she said at least do the walk i said but i can't do the walk without talking i mean i need someone to talk to and so that started to happen right i mean i was that bad at multitasking or whatever you want to say but now i force myself that okay fine this one hour i will just spend walking doing nothing else mm. so whether it is you know i mean i'm not even looking at birds and bees i'm a kuch bhi nahi i'm not doing anything i'm just walking thinking walking thinking it's painful it's it's um, it's a very difficult thing to do for a person like me uh, it, it is very challenging uh, but i'm trying i'm trying that's so, where you're growing <laughs> yeah i don't that's I'm, where you will be growing i hope so i hope so mm. i hope i'm wiser next year when you call me again for your super amazing and super successful podcast i hope i'll be wiser by that time will do will do and you will be and when we were talking you talked about some of the books that you are holding dear even after 30 years can you name some of these books or these books change did they change your thinking i mean why are they dear to you um, um hilarious again so one of them is a dictionary that uh, it's a huge big black dictionary which my father gifted to me uh, it was his dictionary actually but he also came from very humble uh, background so you know he had that will in him to perfect the language to grow get out of his comfort zone and you know figure out and books are the only way you could do it there's no internet then so this dictionary is a black beautiful i mean it's not beautiful it's just beautiful because i'm saying it but it's in tattered condition so those that one book is one of my favorites and there is one how do i say this i'm 46 years old there's this little book that i used to read it's called and i uh, and it titles uh, the far away tree i don't know if your kids are reading it or they cross that stage your kids are brilliant uh, joseph but that's something i still hold very dear to my heart i mean it is the simplest i mean and i have i still go back read it okay then there are comics in the house which i have i just don't have the heart to give away my art cheese comics my <laughs> god how do i tell you this you know my tin tins and my asterisks and this thing there's something that i hold very dear to heart and then i think uh, a lot of the stuff which i was reading in terms of uh, um a philosophy and uh, money was scarce you know because we just when you're growing up so mom would get a she would throw a tantrum if she knew that i had spent 200 bucks at that point in time 30 years back on a book right so the library was one place that i used to go to for that I should really save some money there, but yeah, these are. I mean, I while I'm talking to you, I'm looking at my bookshelf, and yeah, it has this. I don't know if you remember good old days. Um, our dads probably bought those little, you know, twenty six book set for alphabets and encyclopedias, right? So this is one really nice set sitting right next in my room. So that is still around from my dad's time. It's almost thirty five years old now, thirty five, thirty seven years old. Then um, there is a book on animals, which. Um, this bunch of youngsters had gifted to me on my 10th birthday that is there and oh yeah i must tell you my awesome my most favorite book here is the one which is called 5001 jokes for kids it is in tatters it has been binded it has tape all over it but i still laugh like a child when i read through those okay and i had obviously driven the entire house crazy because nobody will get my jokes i'm like no this joke is from the book it is from 5001 jokes you know and my dad is looking at my face he probably get half of it my mom staring me blank my brother is too disinterested he's like i have no idea what you're talking about but that book is something it is probably the closest thing to my heart as on today 5001 jokes for kids bought in sector 17 in the year 19 Um, 83 or 84, and it's an orange cover, and I love it. Wow, wonderful! Among all the books that you have written, uh, you have read, uh, what changed your thinking? What impacted you the most? I think uh, the masters in English literature. Um, uh, when I was doing those two years, uh, that Joseph really cinched. the world and life for me because i was reading a lot of stuff but i think it was really amazing how literature and the one that we were reading at that point of time as part of a syllabus of course i was reading 10 times more than what was part of the syllabus but um i have never seen so much of philosophy in any other subject i have never seen so much of creativity in any other subject i have never seen so much of uh um you know uh, beauty in uh, in a subject so in beauty in words right so i did a lot of reading but i think one of the books that 
and and i i remember i bawled like a kid when i when i read king lear uh, you know that uh, famous drama by shakespeare and i was like if this person who is writing this can move me to tears i mean and i'm and i, I wasn't just crying like that you know in the hindi film you know like one asudar one tear on the side no no it wasn't that i was bawling like a kid because it was so beautiful it was so overwhelming and um, i think that was one of the changing points for me and i mean i'm sure i've had different different uh, you know goal posts at different times mm. things that have changed me but i think in uh, in the university when i was doing my masters when i read king lear for the first time from a literature literature point of view and not from a you know side uh, reading kind of a thing i think that really uh, moved me a lot and you know showed all the emotions of you know father son mm. daughter and you know tragedy what exactly is tragedy i think that defined for me what a tragedy was if i ever look at it as tragedy and it's multiple levels i was totally smitten by that book i mean uh, till date if i was to pick up a book to read randomly it probably be that and i think there were others which we've all read we've done gone with the wind we've done um, uh, ayn rand we've done atlas shrugged we uh, done you know those typical classics and tom sawyer was a favorite of mine and in britain you know this be my favorite i can go back to reading him any or any given point of time so um, uh, yeah those are some of the books that uh, changed life for me very good uh, what's the kindest thing somebody has done for you what is the kindest thing um I think I've just been lucky, uh, plain lucky here. Um, I've I've always been on the receiving side of things. God has always been kind to me. Um, but I think uh, the one thing that I can uh, I'll get all emotional about it is when my mentor found me and decided to adopt me, and mm. just uh, they didn't want anything in return. You know, being a the guy's he's a man. I'm a woman. I'm single. I'm vulnerable. You know, I'm going through a separation. So all kinds of things will come to your mind. That what at the end does he want? We like we're all adults here. We know, uh, you know, that what is expected. But the man didn't want anything in return. He just wanted to be good to someone out of the kindness of his heart. It was just about that because he felt good doing that. It was, and I realized this after a, because initially I was also very hesitant. I we didn't meet in fact for the last one uh, for the first one year that we knew each other we didn't even meet. So um, and this gentleman was constantly you know saying oh I'm coming in Chandigarh to Tika you should come and meet me and I'm saying I'm not going to meet him I don't know what he wants what he doesn't want and I'd say no I have a fever I have this I have back problem. I have this problem. Then he said, "Oh, I really wanted to meet the kids." I said, "Oh, you wanted me to come and meet with the kids?" I said, "This guy's got something right." I said, "Okay, I'll take the kids along." So I took the kids along. I met him, and it's always been like that. And the man does not. And then I realized that it wasn't just me. There were at least two hundred other people in his mm. circle in his life that he had just been nice to, and that's it. And you know we live in such a depraved society joseph at times mm. that it's very difficult for us to imagine why someone would be nice to you without an agenda or a vested interest right it's very very difficult the first thing somebody who is being kind to you your question is like what does he want what does she want there must be some mm. trouble to it there's some so i i realized over a period of time i think some of the most beautiful relationships i've had are all non transactional where mm. we don't measure things with each other that this is x and this is y and you did this much and I'll do that when you just do it because you want to. I mean, you don't care. I mean, whether you're getting something in return, if you get it, is good. If you don't, it's perfectly fine. So uh, I think for me, uh, what he did, and uh, because see, in, in the Indian context also, Joseph, a woman when she loses her place in society as a married woman, and then she doesn't have money. Okay, so mm. there is absolutely no dignity of life. and i said unabashedly across the board whether it is me or any other woman i can guarantee that if she is socially uh, in a stage where she is separated or whatever widowed divorced whatever whatever her situation maybe if she is single and if she doesn't have money there is absolutely no dignity of life that she can expect absolutely zero zilch and whether it is uh, friends whether it is whatever uh, professionally personally i mean you basically just screwed up frankly if you are really ask me so 
growing from there to a stage where I was making money, I could afford my own car, I could raise my kids in a nicer way, I could do a lot of things. I think more than the money, money part, I think it was the dignity that it gave to me, you know, as a professional and personal. And I had written this in a blog, I think three, four days back, that it was again a very personal story that when women or men even for that matter when they are known for that one thing that they do and this is typical for housewives right when that one thing falls apart you just fall with it so what it did for me was since my confidence levels were in any case at minus 100 okay that there was one thing i was supposed to do in the world and that was to you know be married and get married and stay married i couldn't do that for whatever reasons xyz i just it didn't happen to me right so when that fall i fell with it so I, I always say this, that, uh, you know, uh, for me, what that gentleman did was, of course, I'm much better now, things are sorted, and you're in a better space, you know, all of that. But when I didn't have that dignity of life, he got me that, not just the money, but the professional standing as well. So whatever little that has happened is thanks to him teaching me stuff without anything in return. What's your definition of living a good life? Oh, okay. For me, um, see, I, I got when uh, I was from a very middle class family. Like I told you, my dad was in the forge, right? Then I got married into a very wealthy family. And then this particular issue happened in 2012. So you've seen like all sides of the coin, married, unmarried, this side, that side, all of that. I think for me, a good life is uh, how much optionality it can buy for you. Mm. What are the choices that you have? So if you have choices to do the things that you want to, I think you're living a very good life. If it is your choice to be, uh, let us say, um, a very humble teacher in a government school and you're taking home, let us say, 10,000 rupees as salary. Uh, but if this is what you really want to do and you're absolutely fine by owning a scooter and it doesn't do anything to you, I mean, it, the other things in life don't interest you. I think you're 10,000, you're a very, very rich, solid person or, and you're living a very good life. So I think um, uh, the more I think about it, it depends on... Uh, what is it that you really want in life? So once you have that figured, um, I think which I also call self-awareness at a second level, I think once you have that figured, life becomes very easy. I think living a good life means the kind of choices you have. That's it. The number of choices you have, you're pretty much there. I think Wonderful. the one that we say that now I have to do this. I think that mm. for me is not being given an not living the good life. I think that Majburi mm. comes into the uh, picture. I think that for me picks it. Th uh, thank you, Ritika, for all the stories that you shared. Thank you so much, Joseph. I can't tell you how I much mean, this means to me. And you were saying it, it just makes it even more valuable to me because you were again one person that I'm personally, personally very fond of and someone that I respect again personally and professionally at a very, very high level. So thank you so much. I am both humbled and very proud to be on your podcast today. Thank you so much, Joseph. Thank you, Ritika. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and all the stories that Ritika shared. Please share what you liked in our conversations on social media and tag us. And don't forget to connect with Ritika. She's an amazing lady and a very, very gracious lady. Connect with her and get the best out of her. Thank you.